Yo, what is up? You have found We Like the Blazers. I am your host, Ryan Witty Whitledge, and joining me from across the globe, as always, one Mr. Brandon Goldner. Goldner, how are you doing today? Yo, I'm good, all things considered, Ryan, because clearly we're recording for a reason. <laughs> it's been, it's been an eventful couple days in Blazerland. We went we went months with nothing but wild rumors, speculation, and anger, and you and know, zero then podcasts. something and something finally happens, and now here we are, you know, just with wild rumors, speculation, and anger again. So not much ever changes. I mean, we've had more recordings in the last three weeks than we've had in the previous three months. So good on us. Um, shout yeah. out again to Eric. Peterson for coming on and uh, sharing his knowledge and wisdom about the G League and his podcast. Check it out. Kenny's G League podcast. But that's not why we're here. We're here for a different reason. It's not so, very much fun. We knew it was coming. And th- and that's kind of where I want to start. So earlier this week, you know, I'd, I'm for one. I, I have a quibble with radio and and you have podcasts. a quibble, yes, really? uh, with with radio you don't strike and podcasts. Me as a gentleman who has quibbles. If if you're coming to a Blazers centric podcast after Damian Lillard has been traded, does ever is every single one of them legally mandated to list exactly what the trade was? I and for how many so. days? Do, <laughs> and how many days after the trade do you have to list every aspect of it? Because I just I found it, myself hitting skip on so many people's stuff. That's fine. I mean, I would say if it's within the first couple days, and I think we're right on the outer edge of that. So I think it might be legally mandated, but you don't have to. Well, if it is, uh, arrest me now because I'm not going to recap the entirety of it. But Okay, fine. <laughs> a, but as of... Blazers you know, got some stuff. They traded their franchise player, the, maybe the best player in the history of the goddamn team someone who's an all-nba player in his prime they traded him for some stuff right i mean is that what happened that's what happened so early wednesday afternoon and by the way i would also like to announce i am i am now officially retiring from the uh breaking damian lillard news to you job i'm done i'm (laughs) i'm I'm done with that it's over i uh i broke the i broke the news I broke the news to you when he made the trade request, and I broke the news to you when he when the trade finally happened. Did you I think that woes, was going? To, you were my shams. You were my stat muse. Did I um, think those were going to be like ninety some odd days apart, seventy some odd days apart, whatever it was? No, no, I didn't. But but I'm retiring from that. But I truly Wednesday, did wake up to your text that it was you know done, and yeah. I was hoping. It was weird. I saw it and I thought, I I don't know why I thought this. I had no reason to think that you were like kidding or I was like, yeah, like he's joking or whatever. It's like, I threw a screenshot with it. No, I know. And, and, and I was like kind of foggy waking up, but I was like, yeah, no, I didn't. And so anyway, yeah. <laughs> so, All yeah. Right, so you're early, not going to, you're not going to go through the trade Wednesday details. Afternoon. Yeah. Early Wednesday afternoon, Dame was traded to the bucks and because I'm, I, in my mind, I'm counting it as two separate trades. Then Yusuf Nurkic, Nasir Little, and Keon Johnson were traded to the Phoenix Suns. So <laughs> we have to start at the top with the most okay. impactful move that the Trailblazers made. And how are they going to survive without Keon Johnson in this upcoming season? No. <laughs> I don't think they're going to. Yeah, I think this shakes the foundations of the team to its core. Um, Damian Lillard, an, an afterthought. Um yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I again, I'm going to let you drive this ship, but um yeah, where did you want to start with this? There's a I mean, I think there's like a thousand different ways we could probably tackle this. I also yeah. one more thing really quick. I I do want to be mindful of the people listening, first of all, thank you because you listening is what makes this more fun. And second, I know there've been a thousand blazers podcasts. I know because I'm trying to listen to all of them. I'm trying to listen to all of the local ones. I'm trying to listen to all the national ones. I have not gotten through even half of the Dame trade podcast yet. Some podcasts had two podcasts. Some podcasts had an emergency podcast and then a follow-up analysis podcast. So I know there are a lot of podcasts. I get that. So thank you. That's all. Yes. And yeah. Thank you. And it's also part of the reason why we don't necessarily always rush to a podcast because uh, exactly. there are a lot, there are a lot smarter people than us that for one, we want to listen to before we, you know, 
yell into microphones. And for two, you should probably listen to the smart people as well. And then if you care, come get our takes and thoughts and feelings on it. But that's exactly where I wanted to start with once after you came out of your groggy haze of, of thinking I was uh, pulling some sort of prank on you. What was your initial reaction? Because this isn't like a normal thing of like a trade deadline move or something. And this is also, you know, took months to come to fruition. So what, what was your reaction when this, uh, as I call it, the, the long Florida nightmare, uh, is, is finally over. I had two distinct reactions and they came one after the other. One was, thank God it's the bucks. I'm so happy for Dame that fucking rules. And the second reaction, which came very quickly after was, Fuck you, Miami Heat. Go fuck yourselves. So happy about that. And well, because the re- the reason why it wasn't like all of the other stuff, like Dame and what he meant and, all, and being sad is because we'd already done that grieving, hadn't we? We had, yeah, we, had and, we had pre-grieved. Yeah, and that I'm not gonna lie, the you know, the social media reaction kind of caught me off guard when people seemed shocked, not because it was Miami, but because it actually happened. And people had yeah. those drafts chambered for months though. You know, they had the edits, they had the photoshops, they had the thing. Like, I mean, I think people were just clearing out the drafts, honestly. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's just, I, I was caught off guard by how many people were surprised that it actually did happen. So, but I'm, I'm kind of in the same boat. Like my, my initial reaction was, Holy fuck. It's Miami. Okay. Okay. All right. That's Okay. And Milwaukee. then I did. Yeah. yeah. Did I say Miami? Shit. You yeah. Did. Sorry. You got Miami on the brain. Uh, yeah. It's fine. It's a, Ryan's but, already yeah, in South it's, Beach. It's, Whatever. It's holy, holy shit. It's Milwaukee. And, and, and then, you know, I did have a little bit of the chuckle of like, huh? Well, like, Sucks for Pat a Riley. A little wonder, bit of the chuckle? Just a little uh, bit of the chuckle? Man, I chuckled I ha- so hard. I was chuckling while I took my morning shit. I was chuckling while I was doing my coffee. I was chuckling while I was getting ready for work. I was chuckling all day knowing that Pat Riley and his greasy hair wasn't touching Damian Lillard. And then all those fans and so-called reporters could eat shit because they had been nothing but entitled. Man, I'm so mad about this. How entitled can you be? They literally felt entitled to a top 75 player in his prime. Fuck you. I'm sorry. I, I was I, I think, very happy. I think part of it of where, you know, it sounds like you skipped down the street to work out of enjoyment out of Miami. Oh, Heat yeah. Fans pain. Come on. But I'm part not of the it only for me, one. I can't yeah, be the only one. Someone listening I, had to have shared my experience. If not you, I, I doubt you are, but I think part of why it wasn't that big of a thing for me is I really didn't invest myself a lot in Miami heat fan stuff. I never really, I never really had emotionally mature. No, I never had Miami heat fan sneaking into my mentions, uh, from me watching from afar. I realized it wasn't smart to engage with them. If they did, (laughs) that was my problem. (laughs) Every, every now and then, um, you know, I just, I think I th- it was almost like a scheduled tweet of at least once a week going, the Blazers have no desire in Tyler Hero, a.k.a. another guard, and I just leave it at that. You know, so like the Miami thing, well, it does make me a little bit happy, uh, especially with whatever the hell, I, the Brandon, who was the crappy Florida reporter? That was all over oh, that. Oh, Barry the, the, Jackson. There you go. Barry Jackson watching that. I, I will admit I went to his Twitter and watched it, watch how he kind of backtracked and wiggled himself out of that circle. But, but other than that, it, it, you know, I didn't get as much enjoyment out of the, it wasn't Miami. So this, this makes it all the much more better that. And I will so say the lesson I, here, the well, lesson well, here is that being emotionally immature, you get to reap the benefits of Schrodenfreude when something terrible happens, the people that you're being emotionally immature about suck it. Yes. But I will also say that entire saga was a little weird for me. And Miami has soured a lot in my mind. Miami was in the non LeBron years has always been kind of my East coast team. I was riding hard. I think a for lot them. of people are rooting for them in the finals too, right? Like I, I like was, America's team, it, you know, with the Blazers not being in the playoffs last year, I was, I 
took a heat futures bet before the finals even, or before the playoffs even started. So I, I was riding that bandwagon, you know, I've rooted for him for years. Jimmy, I've always thought he was a great guy, great player. Uh, by the way, great little Instagram live that he went and did immediately that said bucks look at tampering, but never mind. I hope no one's my, actually taking that seriously. That was, that was a good move by him. I appreciate yeah, that. Yeah. That, that was great. But so they, they've always, they've always been my team and, for the East. And so I wouldn't have minded seeing Dame out there because I already kind of rooted for him, but you know, and also I don't necessarily have as much Pat Riley hate as I maybe used to, but I, that could be because I really like how Adrian Brody is playing his character in winning time. So, (laughs) (laughs) Oh, poor winning time. Yeah. So, so not too soon. Yeah. So it, that didn't factor too much in, into my reaction. Um, the other That's immediate fair. reaction, the other immediate reaction that people always seem to have is that they always want to grade the trade, grade the trade, grade the trade. And this is one of those weird ones where for one, I, I never think you can grade a trade until like three months after it, you got to see how it all pans out. I mean, like even if players that you're getting are staying and not going to try to turn around and be flip like true holiday is. But this is one of those weird ones where I feel as though almost everybody locally that I've heard talk about it or, or read, um, you know, their, their thoughts on it are grading this significantly lower than the national media is. It's a lot of you're getting A's and A pluses and, and, and all that stuff from, from national guys. And a lot of the local guys, like I know Danny Morang, he's like, as it stands right now, I'm giving it like maybe a C plus. You know, so it, it, do, for one, do you yeah. think we can grade the trade yet? And for two, where in the spectrum would you lean a little more? Does it lean towards that top of that national view or are you kind of a little more measured with everybody kind of more locally plugged into the team? There's a couple things to tease out here. One of them is I think that the difference in local and national grading of the trade right now is really a difference of opinion over Damian Lillard's value on his contract. And I think that what you see is nationally, people are a little bit more clear eyed about the fact that he's owed a ton of money for a ton of years. He will be firmly outside of his prime and that affects your value. It doesn't matter how good of a player you are right now, how healthy you've been and how good of a season you had last year. So I I do believe that local media tends to, overvalue their best players. I think that is natural. I don't think that's unique to Portland. So part of the question is, I think that the local grades are lower because they thought Damian Lillard had more value and national people did not think he had more value. Does that maybe, or maybe they're weighting it in that, you know, the Blazers got a higher, higher grade because they were able to get rid of such an albatross of a contract. So that's a, yeah, that's a good point because I do think, I mean, Damian Lillard does have uniquely high value in Portland because of what he means to the team and to the city that drives ticket sales. Like I think that actually has a dollar value on it, which is something I've argued before and why the Blazers should mortgage the future and build around Dame despite his agent's contract. So I think that's part of it. Then the second part of it, and you already alluded to it is that we don't know what's going to happen with the drew holiday part of the trade. It's also hard to grade trades that include not in this case, but might include um, young players who haven't played in the NBA yet. So you don't really know what their value is now. Mm -hmm. Are we going to grade the trade differently based on whether those swaps kick over or not? I think people tend to rightfully look back and see, well, the actual value of that trade was this, even though we thought it could be that. So all to say, I think that the Blazers did well. I, when I first saw the return, I was a little disappointed that it wasn't more. The thing that's changed my mind since then is drew holidays value around the league. What, I mean, Mm. and for me just to stop talking, but what, I mean, were you surprised to see that drew holidays value seems to be perhaps as high or higher than Damian Lillard's value around the league. Again, not saying as a player, but that we we're hearing returns of the floor is two picks and a player, possibly even three picks. Like that sounds a lot like the Damian Lillard hall. And that surprises me. Does that surprise you? It doesn't surprise me because of the reputation and, and clout that he has with him being, uh, 
a core piece that went to Miami and helped deliver them their championship. And I think one of the, or a couple of the appealing things about him is that he's not, he's not a Batman. He's not going to demand, um, a lot of touches. So talk like this. Are you sure? (laughs) So he, he's someone that you can bring in. He he's built to be a, a complimentary piece. And so you don't have to worry about, Oh, if I bring him in, is this going to upset my star? Or is this going to do this to maybe my top two players? You know, very plug um, and play. He's very exactly steady. He has won a championship. He's known as a good locker room leader. So yeah, like actually and, and, he, a lot of his intangible qualities are very similar to Dame, frankly. Yeah. And then in today's day and age where you have so many hope, high profile scoring point guards, shooting guards. I mean, heck that position is almost just blending together to just be a guard in general, um, him and his defense that he can bring that us in Portland are well aware of how he can impact and lock down a, a player, you know, that's the kind of stuff that, you know, teams are really looking for. So no, I know I am not surprised that his value is as high as it is because he, well, yes, Damian Lillard, obviously, especially to Milwaukee can be the one piece that you need to add to bring a championship to your team. Drew holiday is also that, but for different reasons. Um, the we one, should also, the one thing we should quickly point out that Drew Holiday's contract, he has one year remaining before a player option next year, making $34 million this year with a player option of 37 next year. Mm-hmm. So it's not like he's cheap, but to your point, he's plug and play. He won't upset the balance of whoever your superstar may be. He's proven that he's a championship player. He plays a, you know, a level of defense, which is like best perimeter defender in the league for many years, Mm -hmm. running level of defense. And so, yeah, like what team wouldn't want that unless you already have a point guard. Right. So I mean, you can take off legitimately like 10, 12, 14 teams who could use a drew holiday legitimately. Yeah. And for those that, you know, can you know whether it be some portland fans i haven't seen it as much but you know for when this is aggregated by you know whatever miami fan is a sycophant and has gone deep enough down the rabbit hole to listen to us um i know you barry know, the, jackson is listening what's up barry the, the, di- the difference between drew holiday a guard and tyler hero a guard when we have been screaming from the mountaintops that Portland does not need another guard is that the skill sets that drew holiday has are more, as we just said, valuable to teams. What Tyler hero offers is a value and he is a good player. And that was never the issue. It was never that Tyler hero wasn't a good enough player for one for the blazers. He made no sense functionally for the roster. There was no need for him. And then his skill set is good, but harder to turn around and get premium assets for. You cannot yeah, plug and turned- play Tyler Hero onto any other right on the edge contending team and put them over the edge like you could a Drew Holiday. Yeah, I mean, it turns out that a ball dominant guard who can't play defense is less valuable than a guard who's totally competent on offense and also the best perimeter defender in the league. Who would have thunk it? Like the fact that, again, Miami Heat fans, I'm going to shit on them all episode. Thank you very much. But, oh, I can't believe that the Blazers would prefer Drew Holiday over Tyler Hero. Are you serious? Have you seen the national conversation about what Drew Holiday might get in return as compared to Tyler Hero? So, like, I, to go back to your original, like framing of this question was about trade grades. I agree. It's, it's semi incomplete. I've heard enough from enough different sources to suggest that Drew's drew holidays contract is valuable enough to where this will end up being a, like an above average return for Portland, considering where Damian Lillard was in his contract. So I'm hopeful. I'm curious. Yeah, go for it. And, and the other thing too, with the, with the picks that came back, because I, God bless Miami media and, and the narrative that they try to spin or or what came out, but you know, after this Milwaukee trade goes down and it's suddenly, well, 
you start hearing, well, Miami was uh, willing to offer three picks in Tyler hero and salary filler and another player. No, d- stop throwing in other picks. Stop changing the deal. After the fact, we, everybody knew what the base offer was. It had leaked like the week before Tyler hero two first salary filler. That's what it was. But well, the, 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 the difference between the Miami picks and the Milwaukee picks is one of them is I'm, for I'm, Miami and one of them is for Milwaukee. Is that part and, of the difference? And I'm, well, I'm going to use this in the context of over here on the West coast teams. So if a team is looking at getting three first round picks from the blazers or the Lakers, right. yep. regardless of, you know, you're looking at like, okay, Hey, everybody's getting ready to age out of the Lakers, you know, and in three years, is that, is this team really going to be contending for is or you know, are they going to be that good? Those picks could be lower, but it's but the fact it's that the it's, fucking it's the Lakers, fact, man. And it's the fact that it's LA and it's in an attractive market. They always end up getting people. So it's not like Milwaukee. They were literally where, like the most poorly managed franchise at the end of Kobe Bryant's career, they had virtually no assets. They had no future. They had done nearly everything wrong. And here comes LeBron James. Exactly. To go to LA. So yeah. To, to like, and and he builds it. Yeah. I hate that we're crapping on ourselves, but yeah, like Portland in your example, Portland picks are way more valuable because they're probably going to be shitty in the future. Whereas a team like the Lakers are going to attract free agents. Same thing on the East coast. I'd rather have those Milwaukee picks than the heat picks for the same reason. God love Milwaukee. It same thing as Portland. It's like, I mean, it's actually kind of creepy. The similarities, and by the way, can't wait to get my bucks Lillard Jersey, but no one's clamoring to go to Milwaukee. So yes, like I would rather have one outright pick and two swaps, which is what it ended up being. Mm-hmm. And that's in a swap in 2028, a pick in 2029 and a swap in 2030. My God, that is seven years from now would rather yeah. have those from Milwaukee than from the heat because they're just more likely to be more valuable period. Yeah. And it's all unprotected. And you look at age wise, I think at that point in time, Giannis is, is going to be 34, somewhere in that range, uh, uh, 33, possibly, um, uh, Damian Lillard looking at being 38 years old, you know, everybody's aging out. And at this point, especially with all these moves that they've made, they have kind of leveraged themselves into a corner to where you can comfortably say like when this era and iteration is over in, you know, three, four years or whatever, they may end up going down the they're going to suck. So and I will you're, a lot, say, you're a lot more confident in there, or you're a lot more confident in their inability to attract talent than you are. Miami's could suck an ability to attract talent. Yes, I totally agree with that. I will. One more wrinkle though, is because the bucks did this, the bucks are aware that they do not control their own draft between 2020 and 2030. That means when that time comes, they won't have any organ organizational pressure to take. So that incentive, right? So like, yeah, that's just just something I've been curious about with all of these so far out future first round picks that have gone out with all these major moves with teams is you're not going to have that many teams that are in control of their own, you know, draft lottery destiny or, you know, or, do they want to really give somebody else a high lot? Like there's not going to be intentional tanking. So I'm really curious to see like Sam Presti and Danny Ainge just sitting there shuffling picks back and forth. Exactly. And so what's it going to be like in three years when you don't have a bunch of teams intentionally tanking because they're like, we don't even own our own pick. We're going to see naturally crappy basketball instead of uh, manufactured crappy basketball. We also, I know this is too far afield, but like the NBA is already lightly starting to clamp down on tanking. And we even have murmurs now because of this Chris Haynes article about Damian Lillard's departure from Portland that the NBA may or may not investigate Portland for sitting Damian Lillard down at the end of last season. And also we don't know what's going to happen. Like we have a new in-season tournament. Are they going to shorten the season? Yes or no. Are they going to tighten up the rest policies even more? Yes or no. So like just knowing Will teams even be tanking in five or six years? Yes, probably. Maybe the lottery gets overhauled or maybe it doesn't. But all of this is just to say, we don't know any of that. But you know what we Mm -hmm. do know? We know that Milwaukee is in Wisconsin. We know Miami's in fucking Florida and people want to go there because it's sunny and whatever. Like, we do know that. 
And so I do think that for that reason alone, the Bucks picks are more valuable than the Heats. Yes, I will say though, because uh, my my family does hail from the Midwest, uh, the state right right next door over in Minnesota. Uh, you know that area of the country, it's not that bad. Uh, yeah, 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 I mean, yeah they've sure. got ramen jello, so I don't really know how much I can trust them. They have what? Ramen jello. You know what I'm talking about? If you're from the Midwest, they put shit in jello all the time, including ramen. It's very strange. Like spaghetti can jello. Admit, never heard of this. Seven really? years of my life has been has been spent living in Minnesota, and never once really? can I say that I saw I ramen literally, jello. Literally went to Cassie's friend's house in Minnesota, in Minnesota, and they had people come over for a potluck. And you know what? One of the items they brought. Ramen Jello. So don't even. What was your head in a hole, Ryan? For God's sake! I no, swear. I was eating delicious White Castle, probably. But that's fair. Uh, this was in a <laughs> semi-rural part of Minnesota. Were you in like the the big city? Were you in Minneapolis? Where were you? Uh, yeah. Uh, my most of my when I lived there, I lived in Stillwater, which was like thirty minutes outside of the Twin Cities, and then my uh, my family uh, split time between being in St. Paul and Minneapolis. So, fair enough. All of you uh, Minnesota listeners, you can fact check me on that. I know I'm right. Um, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, okay. So after after all that, you know, coming through, it's it can't necessarily grade the trades, but then 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 everything starts settling in, and now we get the fallout. Um. The first thing that kind of happened is Dame releases a track the same day, put it out on iTunes. I gave it a bit of a listen. Some of it seemed to be taking digs. Some of it, you know, just kind of saying his piece, whatever. Good little catchy song. I actually thought he was going to just leave it at that and not, I thought that was his like goodbye. He wasn't going to write it in a notes app and post anything. I was just like, oh, okay, you interesting. Thought. Yeah. You thought. And so I knew I'll... there was more. I was like, this guy, I, Hey, look, I, we say this because we love Damian Lillard. That dude loves to talk about himself, which is like, fine. There's nothing wrong. Mm-hmm. Like, and especially, I mean, this is to his, you know, He's I don't really mean that as a billion dollars while doing it. So, yeah, I, I don't, that sounded bitchier than I meant it to. I, it, so yeah. What did I really mean when I just said that? What I mean is that Damian Lillard, has never been shy to express himself. And he does that. He does it, you know, as often as is reasonable. I think that he has had to hold back during this trade request process. Right. Yeah. I think that drove him insane too. That's what I'm saying is I think it's probably been tough for him. This is like the biggest change of his career. And I, I, I legitimately think he would have liked nothing more than to just kind of be honest about what he was experiencing and feeling and couldn't do that. So to that point, I was like, I know there's more coming. That Mark Spears, I believe, that sit down that he did, you know, a couple weeks back or whatever, where, you know, he just said, I'm not going to comment on the Trailblazers at this time. Like yeah, the look on the his right face, move. the it, it was the right move. And but the look on his face with having to say that looked like somebody was literally had like his nuts in a vice grip. And <laughs> so but he's I, I, I hope. I mean, Dane can do whatever he wants to after he retires, but like he would be great in organizational leadership, like in for a team or for the league, like he's got great discretion. He's got great emotional maturity. He's an incredibly good communicator. He's really good at PR stuff. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and then, so that was, that was that same day. And then Thursday hits and you know, everybody's putting out their pieces and, and whatnot after their overreaction and, and Shams comes out with something on the athletic and he puts out his article and it's basically like, Hey, how'd we, how'd we get here? And it goes through everything from that, you know, there, how negotiations broke down a lot of, a lot of what he quoted and he sourced was coming from Goodwin and how Dame's camp took a lot of things. And he references that, you know, Dame came back at one point and was like, Hey, you know, I can come back to the team, you know, and rescind the trade offer until you can get something worked out with Miami that comes out early morning. And that kind of goes under the radar. Nobody really freaks out about it. You know, it, it gets its traction, but whatever. And then Chris Haynes later that night writes his piece that, is talking about how the trade came to be and, and how the parties got here, but it omitted a single sentence that completely changed the entire tone and demeanor of the piece. Now there are other differences in it, but the biggest thing that got picked up on, because again, 
when even though Shams was speaking with Dame's agent and Aaron Goodwin to get the story as it happened, Haynes speaks directly to Dame. We've we all know that that's his guy, but the version that comes out in Haynes's story is just that Dame went back to Cronin to rescind his trade offer or, and said, Hey, I'd like to rescind it. And Cronin said, no, it can't be done or, you you know, whatever, completely leaving out that it is only so Dame's like, Hey, I'll come back. It'll be fine. I'll rescind it or I'll rescind it. I'll come back happy and whatever until you can get a deal worked out with Miami. That little piece is omitted in that. And the internet fucking blew up. It did. And what were, and by the way, and journalistic malpractice on this, because this drives me insane about media in general, because then on Haynes's podcast this morning, um, which for whatever reason, I'm immediately blanking on the title of it. Um, but on his, he goes on to talk about his story, but he puts that, that missing piece of context from his article into his talk on the podcast. But my, my journalistic malpractice is that, if you if you get something like that, so not not so wrong, but that's the verbiage I'm going to use, and to not try to put out a louder correction, retraction, whatever, and this goes for anything, Why not even he, just sports. That got the reaction Damian Lillard wanted. I'm sure it's it did, exactly but it's what he all wanted. sorts of disingenuous. Like I was sitting there. Chris, absolute, Chris Haynes I, is an excellent reporter and also <laughs> depends on Damian Lillard, you know, depends on Damian Lillard. I mean that, that you're right. I mean, from like a moral journalistic standpoint, but that the way he framed that line again, and not that he got it so wrong, but that he intentionally, left out that bit of context probably was intentional. Even if it wasn't, they loved that reaction. How many people did we see on Twitter? But I can't believe it. Joe Cronin's a snake. I was with Joe Cronin until now a couple, a couple of people who I respect, but I'm going to make fun of them without saying their name saying, I knew this the whole time. And now finally you see why I've been defending him because of this horrible thing. And it was like, Yo, like that's the reaction Damian Lillard wanted. So why would he retract it? The thing for me is like between the Shams article on the athletic and this article on Bleacher Report with, with Haynes, I feel as though there was enough other damning information to where he could have painted the same light that he did without that little bit, because there's, there's the bit in there about, you know, when Dame came back to the practice facility, Cronin didn't even say hi to him. Bitch move, Joe. Gonna admit that. That's <laughs> probably not freaking great. The fact that the NBA had to get involved and sit everyone down in a fucking parent teacher conference and tell them to freaking stop smacking each other, basically, and learn to cooperate in a Zoom meeting. That's, that's not good for the organization. I mean, also not good for Damon, especially Goodwin, but we'll talk more about the blame game on that stuff later. But, you know, there were so many other damning bits of information about how everybody is kind of fucked up during this whole process. That but that, you and, just said it though. You just said it, how everyone's fucked up that line that he intentionally well, or not mischaracterized puts it squarely on Cronin, which is what they wanted. They wanted people to think that of course they did. And this is the, not like, yeah, go for it. Yeah. The one other thing that I'm super curious about too, is because the intentionality, I think we can agree that there was some of that you're, you're, you're saying as much too with Haynes's piece and whatever. I don't personally feel as though these two pieces are necessarily trying to quote unquote spin a narrative for one. I, I very much take it as that this is Dame's telling of a situation and you know, Goodwin was giving like just his own telling of the situation. They're telling the same situation and just, they have their own, own versions. It doesn't mean one's trying to spin the other. I think I, I made a tweet earlier, you know, replying to somebody about something. Um, sorry, a Zeet and X, whatever the fuck, um, <laughs> saying like, Hey, if my wife asked me to unload the dishwasher and four hours later, I unload the dishwasher, but then she complains that I didn't do what she said. 
yet I'm saying, no, I did what you said, but her, her whole thing is because I didn't do it right away means I didn't listen. Like it's kind of one of those same situations, but sorry. Hold on. Wait a minute, hold on. I, I want to okay. pick this part some more because first of all, it sounds like we don't agree that anything coming from Aaron Goodwin or Dame. And then I think to a strong, but maybe lesser extent from Chris Haynes, all of that is there's one common purpose in this point in time about this situation, which is to preserve Damian Lillard's legacy and to make him look as good as possible. I don't, and especially with Aaron Goodwin, I, I, I find there there's no individual account that Aaron Goodwin, the individual is going to give in this situation right now. That's not going to be solely for the purpose of furthering Damian Lillard's image that because that's his job. And but, then again, I would, and then I would but say he gave also, that account to shams an article that went completely unnoticed and under the radar without the massive freak out. And those you want to know what same you call couple that? lines in there. You call that a calibration well, piece. <laughs> he <laughs> gets that out. No, I'm not kidding. Like you get that out there. Oh, didn't really, didn't really do what we wanted it to. All right, here comes Chris Haynes. And people know that Chris Haynes is close to Damian Lillard. I, again, this is, I'm not saying that this happened, but it does give you the people around Damian Lillard who depend on him and who are close to him. It gives you data to say this piece was received this way. So we really, we need people to be on our side here. So what can we do? I'm not saying that that happened. I'm not saying that that's why the story changed more. My point or, is that, or even that maybe that, was from Dame's camp. That could have been something along the lines of a good one kind of stepping over and being like, eh, cross that out. So maybe, maybe, I mean, I, my, my bigger point is that if Aaron Goodwin is speaking right now, it's to further Damian Lillard, his legacy and his image, because that's his job. And that's what he should be doing. Yeah. Um, I do want to mention though, really quick. I'll oh, go for it. I was going to say the, the one thing that I'm super curious about, and it was where I was getting before I got off on that tiny tangent. The one thing I'm curious about, did the, did Dame know, like, does, do you think Haynes tells him like, Hey, it's in the editor. It'll be out in an hour. Yes, definitely. Then 100%. why on God's green earth would Haynes's article and Dame's super long goodbye, you know, eight, eight slide or his PowerPoint presentation goodbye be released so soon. I really feel that was a very big miscalculation because everything that came out in the Haynes thing massively seemed to overtake Dame's emotional goodbye letter. But uh, okay, I I it's funny because I think that was very on purpose because again, Damian Lillard the person, his goodbye was impeccably unimpeachably, you know, productive, positive with Didn't mention the, Joe the, Cronin once. With that one exception, with that one exception, but everything in it, everything that you could read was impeccably positive, but that is what Damian Lillard wants people to think of him legacy preservation. However, so you, think it was still... a, you think it was a two pronged thing of here is, here is my heartfelt somber goodbye letter. I hope to see you guys again soon. Someday I broke my heart as well as yours we all feel sympathy for Dame and then Haynes comes out and has this article that paints the organization and especially Cronin in such bad light where we're already sympathetic to Dame. Now we're even more likely to want to shit on Cronin. Yeah. One of them is, this is my voice. And the other one is, sorry. The first one is, this is my name. The second one is, this is my voice, but not with my name. So <laughs> Damian Lillard doesn't want people to be like, Oh damn, Dame's talking shit. I wasn't talking shit. Yo, that was, that was Chris Haynes. That was his article. He's a reporter. He says sources that was shams. That wasn't me. So that, I, yeah. and like, again, like I, I, I'm not, I truly am not trying to like conspiracy brain. This is literally how organizations work. This is how public figures work of all stripes, political sports, whatever is when you're this powerful, when you are worth this much, you spend a lot of time thinking about like, how does my message get out through which channels? What is my voice, but I don't have to put my name on. And then what is my voice that my name is attached to? Those are two different things, but they should be serving the same purpose, which is to kind of maintain your image and preserve your legacy. So yeah, like I look, Damian Lillard knows what he's doing. I do want to mention really quick, pat myself on the back. I went baby viral with this one tweet, which is after the, sh after the Haynes story dropped, it's funny. Cause I interpreted that 
misinterpretable line differently about Dame would have come back. He would have come back guys, but Cronin didn't want him back. I, when I read that, I immediately was like, well, that's because they said we will come back and kind of wait for Miami. My brain clicked that in automatically. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote, you know, Cronin's big betrayal is not wanting Dame back on the team after his agent told other teams he wouldn't play for them, which would have put zero pressure on Miami to up their offer ever. Then I can't participate in the outrage because that makes perfect sense to me. And that's true. So yeah, I I agree with that. Yeah. Anyway, like, and I think, uh, how did your mentions do after I said, God bless, (laughs) they were fine. You know, again, baby viral, you know, didn't quite crack a thousand likes, but got 82,000 views. Um, but like, again, like it's not, if someone else would have said it, if I hadn't said it and a ton of people were thinking it, so it wasn't like some cool insight, but it's just, again, like, yeah, like I was honestly, man, like I wanted to ask you this, didn't you think we, so, okay. First of all, we knew a Chris Haynes piece was coming out at some point. Yes. We knew that was going to happen mm-hmm. and we knew it was going to be in Dame's voice, but not his name. Did you think that there was going to be like a bigger betrayal, like a bigger thing that Joe Cronin did to really piss him off? Did you think there was like something bigger than, than, than that? No, but I think to Dame, feeling lied to is the bigger betrayal. So me not being shocked by that being massively alluded to in the story. Um, when we've been hearing the narrative all summer on our ends of that, Oh, well, Cronin lied to Dame Cronin lied to Dame. And, you know, I defended Cronin plenty and I get that he's next on our list of things to talk about in our blame game, you know, whatever topic, but, (laughs) um, no. So it wasn't shocking to me, but I think that that was the most damning piece that maybe Lillard was trying to get across through that through that voice as using Haynes as a mouthpiece is just kind of trying to explain how he was so misled and, and eventually had basically had to ask for a trade. So what am I I missing in that piece about Joe Cronin lied? Cause I'll admit, like I thought, Based on what well, some yeah, people those, had those said, those words weren't said, but it's when they're outlining the story of like, oh, and then they take the third pick. You know, they're going to get Dame help, but then they take the third pick. And that's, you know, stuff like that. I, I'm like, that's how they got here. That's I why I'm not super, shocked and surprised about it. I, I'll, here's what I was expecting I was super expecting in, in a Chris Haynes piece for there to be like third pick and the Blazers. Sources say they had multiple offers for a young wing under contract and Joe Cronin hung up the phone. I thought I was going to see that. The fact that we saw nothing like that in the Chris Haynes article, the fact that we didn't see that tells me everything I need to know, which was there was no trade. Sorry. Well, Dame, like Dame's, co- Dame's cousin tried to jump in and stir the pot again today. You know, that there were, I don't know if you saw it, but the, there were two needle, mo- two needle movers, but they weren't interested. I, I, I kinda, don't trust Dame's cousin on this. I'm sorry. Like yeah, I, I, and, I, and I respect him. I don't trust him. Like it's, it's fine. I, I threw out the, Hey, well, you know, kind of helpful if you were to say the, say the who, who, and, and from where and blah, blah, blah. And the the you know, reason otherwise why you're just yelling would, into the wind. I understand he that, won't and why come, he can't. How would that information come to Dame's cousin and not to any national or local reporter and have it leak out at some point? Yeah. Why, why would that not be included in the Haynes piece? It's because it didn't happen. Yep. And so ever, I think he maybe got called out on it or Dame and said, Hey, knock that shit off. And that tweet is now deleted, but right. um, He made it up. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. And last little thing here, you know, like, like I referenced Dame did release his, uh, his, uh, eight page PowerPoint presentation of a goodbye. <laughs> that was excessive. It, it was excessive. Uh, I think he said goodbye and thank you from, you know, Jody Allen, skipping Joe Cronin, but all the way down to maybe the towel boy 
or the janitors. <laughs> I, I think I, he, I, there are some names in there where it I'm was like, an impressive Ooh, name dropping feet. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, all right, great. I, the, some of these people Why have some, we off. mentioned where the fuck was we like the blazers in that. Come on. Now in that, you know, I, I, I do believe, you know, Sean Hyken was massively caught off guard by being thanked. Uh, I, Danny, an, an actual Danny, reporter. I know was yeah, Danny, I know was shocked, but, and here's one of the thing about Danny. I hope he's still enjoying his victory lap because that man has taken a whole bunch of crap about, you don't know squat and most of what he's talked about and said over these past yes. couple months has happened. And here's one I, of the things, and here's one of the things I know about Danny. I mean, you used to, you, you used to do podcasts and stuff and interact with him back at your days in blazer's edge. I know him through having met him through podcasts, him and I do have, you know, an acquaintanceship, not a friendship, but things that I know about him is like, he, he does not put stuff out there unless he has multiple sourced it. And one of the things about him too, is that especially given a dame situation that man at any point in time can open up his phone and show you the text that he sent the day before and or was sent from damian lillard about a topic of them legit just having a conversation the only difference is danny's not doing it for you know clout and national writing he does this crap because he enjoys it and he loves it you know he's said many times like espn could call me tomorrow I'm, i got a radio show in portland covering my favorite teams i'm fine and so that's the thing about danny I, so I, I think he was mildly shocked and surprised the jason quick one that wait, is really, an accident really quick, we're like i'm gonna let you go but like really quick okay. like i do want to give danny his flowers and and like i think that yes i this saga and the he's put in years of work and mm -hmm. he is a legitimate reporter. He started as someone who's more of an analyst and he should be respected. Even if you don't always agree with him, period, keep going. Yeah. And you can talk to some of the old school guys from, you know, blazer's edge that when they were working at SB nation and Danny's working his way down to summer league and he's grinding back in those little rooms and, you know, working his way in. And as somebody who's been there before and tried to get their way around there, that shit ain't easy. And yeah, it does take years <laughs> to, to get up those kind of connections. But, um, anyway, so congrats, Danny, enjoy the victory lap. Um, the, the one that I was surprised to see though was Jason quick. I, I know you have your own kind of thoughts and feelings about uh, old quickers there, but uh, what <laughs> old quickers when, when you wow. saw that, well, that he, he threw quick's name in there and, and admitted that, Hey, we've had our beef, but I understand your job's hard and whatnot. What was, what, how do you take that? I think it's fine. I think Damian Lillard understands the, <laughs> Damian Lillard is an empathetic person and he genuinely cares about other people. It's probably the best way to put it. And he understands mm -hmm. that jobs like that jobs, like, you know, Casey Holdall covering the team, I think is in like a particularly unique spot um, because you're sitting there clapping as I'm trying to give my little monologue. Let's Sorry, go give us a peek, peek behind the curtain. Mariners win. So it's oh, it good. Was, good job. Yeah, so it was eight, eight to nothing. The game wasn't in doubt, oh, but wow. it's, it's nice. It was just a pop out to end the game. I like so, but they're, fist pump they're, and a golf clap. No, it's good. Their play their playoff hopes live. So anyway, good. sorry. <laughs> no, good, good, good for the Mariners. So anyway, I, I, I thought it was good. I think Damian Lillard understands to, you already said it, that it's not easy to be a reporter that most reporters treat players with a certain amount of deference and respect, uh, that's not always returned. Um, and I think Damian Lillard is someone who returns that in spades. I think he, again, he's an empathetic person and he sees people as people, um, which is something that <laughs> is, um, really cool about him and what makes him so easy to root for. So yeah, that was good. Good job, Jason quick. And then finally, before uh, before we take a little break and uh, then come back with the blame game, uh, Dame did end it with that he does hope to come back to Portland one day and retire here. Do you think he Do does? Do you have that last couple lines I think is worth recounting the, because on it's the very pretty... last slide? Yeah, I yeah. can find it real quick. Uh, do, 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 please. As you're looking, oh, as you're go. looking, that I'll, was I'll exciting to see. I'll read the entirety of this, of this last slide. Not as the this, whole thing, no. Page one. 
<laughs> God damn it. Anyway, as this chapter of my life ends, I look back and realize how special it was. Even in this moment, I feel sad that we never accomplished what I so badly wanted to. I don't cry much, but I know my love for you is real because I am for sure dropping some tears right now. Rip City, you know my heart and where I stand because I've stood there for over a decade. So to have to move off of my square hurts my heart. As my guide chief says, one man don't stop no show. And the show in Rip City must go on with or without me. I do believe a day will come where I'll put on a Blazers uniform again. And hopefully by then, I'll be forgiven for breaking your hearts along with my own. Uh, man, that's rough. That gave me a tear. Well, no, that, yeah, it, yeah. And, yeah, and we'll rough. talk more about some of the little nuanced details in there of being forced off his square and breaking his own heart. But we're going to take a quick break real quick, and then we'll come back. See ya. Alrighty, so we're back. And now everybody's favorite pastime. Assign blame, figure out who's at fault, figure out who's the good guy, who's the bad guy. It's and, the blame game. <laughs> and I'm just gonna admit off the bat that I hate this only because you hate it, it so much you put it right into the show notes. Yep. But <laughs> I, I it's it's more that I hate where the discourse has ended up with this in this situation because you have fans that are fans of Damian Lillard. You have fans that are fans of the team, but there doesn't seem to be able to be a nuanced conversation where you can assign portions of blame to certain parties without somebody immediately jumping down your throat going, Oh, how is, how is this, this person's fault? How is this, this person's fault? Oh, what about this person? And I'm just going to come out and say it. every single person who has a finger anywhere near this entire situation, all shares some f- way, shape or form of blame. Can we agree on that? Yes. And so where I want to start talking about, some of this the blame only is I, blameless person in this is Brooke Olsen. Damn. She has literally done nothing wrong. Okay. Wow. What did Lamar heard do? <laughs> I need oh, to dirt man. on that. How did her dirty this situation up? No, that's no, it. Man, t- Lamar, by the call, way, I'm calling to Lamar I, I will, I will forever remember the fact that he remembered who I was when I popped up on where in the world. And he talked about how he had, met me and said, what up? I mean, what a cool plus, I mean, come on, Oregon state alum, like, come on. I mean, if you um, went to a better school, I could, I could be a bigger we fan. We're not going to talk about that. Hey, you're beating Utah right now. So it's fine. Okay. But, uh, anyways, um, so I just have this broken down and we're going to go through each individual category. And I'm also going to preface this, that this is in no particular order. The order of this does not have any sort of weight here. But okay. I have the Trailblazers or Trailblazers ownership slash organization, Damian Lillard, okay. Aaron, Aaron Goodwin, and Joe Cronin. And we're going to start with the ownership Wait a slash minute. organization. Can I edit this list really quick? Uh, are Please. you going to put Lamar Hurd on it? No. <laughs> <laughs> if you're going to put Joe Cronin on it, dot, dot, dot. You know where I'm yeah. going with this. I don't even have to tell you. Yeah, don't worry. That's covered in, That's already covered in a topic. How I know where you, you're going. I'm, I'm, I know where, where you're going. What topic? Them. Okay. It, I said slash organization, but it just, it does just say ownership. Would you like me to I, I, here live editing on the fly? This, this is how we make <laughs> Let's this. See the, I can see it. Yeah, I can see your cursor. Shout out yep, to there, Google Docs. There we go. Flash. Organization. There we go. Are you better now? No, we'll that's there. not what I was going to say. My guy. Are you going to shit if on you, Neil? If you're going to put Joe He's Cronin's in, name on there, you're going to call Joe Cronin out by name. Okay. Are you serious? Brandon, let me walk you through this. Ryan? Let me walk you through this. So the reason where I want to start with the ownership and organization is because this goes back over the entirety of the tenure of Dame's career here. And the Trailblazers as a franchise, and this is including especially Neil O'Shea before, did not do what we just witnessed Milwaukee do, where the star said, I need... or." displayed some skepticism and said, I need help. And then went out and got help at the high cost of 
somebody who is an integral part of that organization. So hey, is your hand cramped from cupping Neil O'Shea's balls right now? And Olshea fucked this up because he was reluctant to trade CJ at the height of his trade value. Um, he was reluctant to make any sort of big move in the event that it failed. He was scared by the thought of so scared by the thought of failure that he held this organization and Damian Lillard back from having increased success. Okay, I feel better. I don't know why you didn't just name them, though, but I, I get it. Be- kind of, because but... because this also goes to, you know, Paul Allen, you know, uh, rest his soul when he was an he was an owner for six years before he passed away in Damian Lillard's career. And we all know that Paul liked to tinker. We knew that he liked to have his hand in things. You know, he was. Part I think of there are this. so many bad owners that we kind of overrate Paul Allen as an owner. He was not always a good owner. No, like, he wasn't. He famously so. tinkered and fucked up a lot of drafts. He he wanted to keep players that just he liked because he saw cool film on them. You know, that's why he wanted to draft. So, but, and he played, a, you know, he was more, he, Paul Allen as a billionaire, he was, he was famously fickle to the point of, you know, we have the Cho chop as something that we say for somebody who gets axed right away because of rich Cho. Yet somehow he allowed Neil O'Shea to manipulate him for years. O'Shea has his fingerprints over all of this. And it, it got to a point under Neil or from Neil O'Shea, not pulling the trigger for so long for Paul Allen, letting it go on for so long for then when he passed away, Jody Allen, I don't know. I mean, she still hasn't ever really given an interview on the team, you know, not having, you know, for as much as Dame thanked her in his thing, you know, not really having anything to do with what's going on and kind of just letting Burt Cold do whatever, you know, all of that played a part in getting to this point because the situation got so bad that, you know, Cronin said, Hey, with this 18 month turnaround, two year turnaround. Well, guess what? It didn't end up being that because that ball of twine got so hard to untangle from the organization and ownership before that it, it just it wasn't fixable so that I, that's where i lay that at and that's why i say that hey i didn't name him by name but because he's not the only person in that ownership organization over this last decade he's definitely got the biggest part in his reluctance to get rid of people and make moves like i said his fear of whatever got us there but that that's where i place that you know that that's where hey, the shake ownership out, shake out those cramps Good job. Shake out those hands. And, of yours. Uh, yeah. No, I, yeah. So, you, like, are you going to apologize for saying I was cupping his balls there? <laughs> no, because it was funny and I wish I hadn't laughed through it. Cause it would have been a great line. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. You did account for it. I think that, I mean, honestly, you're talking blame. It's hard to say anything other than that is where the overwhelming majority of the blame lies is with the ownership slash organization. I mean, would you disagree with that? No, no, because again, the man is you can't in town. convince me. You can't convince me that like the nine years that preceded it was somehow less impactful than the 18 months that Cronin specifically has been in power. So if you're talking like the non, yeah, we just have a recency, we have a recency bias with it. And right. you know, some of it, so, which we'll get to when we talk about Cronin, but Cronin did sell a bad bill of goods or over promise and under deliver here. But the, the next person that deserves some blame in this, and I'm going to delete all of my social media after I say this name, but is Damian Lillard. He oh, now you for one fucker for one. I don't you son of a bitch. I don't begrudge him for not necessarily knowing Ryan's how address to- is, <laughs> how to handle uh, a trade demand when he had never been in this position before. That's where he should lean on his agent who will Aaron Goodwin will be next. Oh, Don't worry. Animal baby but, did that show in this process. Yeah. He's definitely but, never done this before. <laughs> this, I, the way that this came about was very much. He somewhat handled it like other superstars have, but he had built up such a loyalty and all that brand. Well, also a big part of his brand is also being a good guy because he is a good guy that he couldn't necessarily 
either throw his weight fully behind it without saying, I need the fuck out of here. This is shit. You know, like maybe he needed to, and even maybe he needed to a little earlier, you know, like, so it's like just, a certain superstar in a certain small market city who actually did that. And it seems like it's worked out pretty fucking well for him. Yeah. So, you know, it's, he miscalculated, I think on how to handle it. I can't begrudge him that much for it though, because he had never necessarily been in the situation, leverage that kind of weight. Um, the well, other to the thing- point that, sorry, the point that I just made though, is like Giannis Antetokounmpo has basically put public pressure on the Bucks organization more than once to say, I love Milwaukee. I love it here. I want to be here. I want to win. And I want to win right now. Mm-hmm. That is something Damian Lillard didn't say as strongly for as long as Giannis has. And part of it is and lots of other reasons, but like how Giannis handled this summer specifically, he said, I will go somewhere else if we're not going to win here. Like he was very comfortable saying that. And no one really called him disloyal. Like I, I think if Damian Lillard could do it over again, he would put more public pressure on the organization sooner. I bet you he would, if he could change it. Yeah. Exactly. And then, you know, the other thing too is, and signing the extension, you know, I think internally, maybe that writing was on the wall a little more for him and he could have done the, you know, I understand, get the bag. Players are always going to get the bag. That was a big ass bag, but Olshay was hesitant to hand him that extension, which was a point of contention between the organization and Damian Lillard because of how much money and how much that would hamstring it, you know, and Cronin right away got that done, but signing that extension made things difficult. Um, Other than that, like the rest of it kind of ties in with our next guy. And that's Aaron Goodwin of just over, over leveraging, this and you know some of this some of this dame and goodwin stuff goes hand in hand because i i assume dame leaned on his agent but aaron goodwin could not have overplayed his hand any worse in this and the way to go about this would have been for them to request the trade and if they wanted to go to miami say hey here's the Nets, here's Toronto, or here's the Nets, here's Philly, and have Miami on that list and have that be the list that goes out there. Well, working behind the scenes with Miami and with the Blazers to get a deal done. But coming out and saying Miami only, and I'm calling everybody else and telling them to stay the fuck away, you took all of Portland's leverage away. I was just uh, listening to something uh, Danny Morang was talking about um, earlier today on his radio show on 1080. And he was saying that, you know, they back Cronin into a corner. And when you back somebody into a corner, they're either going to go through you or around you. And Cronin had have a, absolutely nowhere else to go, but through them. I have a nuanced take on this actually. Go ahead. Kind sir. I don't think it was Aaron Goodwin not realizing that was going to happen. I think this was intentional and I think they miscalculated. I think they gambled and lost. I think what they thought was, well, shit, Miami's cupboards a bit bare. It'd be nice if I could get to Miami and have them not get rid of everything. everything. Yeah. So I think what they thought was we will ice the market. Cronin will have no choice. He will have to deal me there. I do believe that is the calculation they made. They gambled, they lost. And also like to do it in such a brazen way, like to do it to the point where the NBA is literally investigating your ass and to the point where the NBA's memo says Aaron Goodwin's stories about the, this was mostly, but not entirely consistent with what we heard from other teams. That is really not good. And uh, so, I, I mean, it's interesting, right? Like, cause I mean, they clearly, again, they thought that they could get Joe Cronin to just simply acquiesce and that's not what happened. So I, I don't think it was ignorance. I think it was an intentional strategy that did not work for them. 
Yeah. And I, I think maybe they might have underestimated Cronin a little bit of uh, thinking that he wouldn't necessarily have as much of a backbone as he ended up having. Uh, I, I 100 percent agree that some of the I'm not going to deal with Miami stuff and is 100 uh, percent out of spite, spite pitch. So that good win. I would I would I would maybe debate that a little bit, but, you know, whatever I, I like. Yeah. I think I get like, I think it's, you can't ask a representative of a multi-billion dollar organization to just take whatever for your most valuable asset by far. You just can't, Mm -hmm. you you can't like, you can't expect that they're going to acquiesce to that. And I thought it was dumb. I think if they had just been more clear eyed about like, okay, like, Miami's going to need to come out with a low offer at first and then kind of up the offer and let the market do its thing. Then I'm firmly believe Dame would be in Miami right now. If they yeah. had simply let that happen. Agree a hundred percent. So it, the, the, the full bore balls to the wall, Miami or bust, we're going to paint you in a corner in which you can't get out of. Like you said, he gambled and he lost and Cronin got out of it. And so now Cronin, everyone's favorite internet villain. And I'll start this off too, by saying, I, I, I think I quote tweeted something yesterday where, cause I'd seen a couple things where like people are calling for Cronin's head, like legit out there. Where's this man at? I'm about ready to serve some revenge on his ass. People, please. Oh, as, cool as passionate as we are as My sports fans, God. can we not literally threaten some people because your favorite player, you know, was done dirty. Please don't do that. It. That's it, there's it's, no reason to do that. It's not funny. It's not cool. Don't do that. No, it, it is not talking a big game. It's not making you look like a tough guy or tough girl or whatever. It's making you look like an ass. So, but well, this actually, well, I'm just, I'm thinking now I'm looking at the end of this Google doc and this may just be the absolute perfect segue, but I'll leave it to you. Well, where I think for the last bit of this blame for Cronin, Cronin is not the salesman that Neil O'Shea was. And Cronin said a lot of shit and made a lot of promises that he obviously either at some point in time decided not to keep or had an oh shit moment and realized that he couldn't keep. Uh, I think we all agree biggest, on that. The biggest fault was the exit, the media exit, you know, when he publicly said, we are going to go all in, we are a thousand percent committed to Dame. We have this incredible, we'll have this incredible asset in the lottery and we are going to make a move that is so big that people are going to go, what they did, what? And then he proceeded to not do that. You know, uh, challenge your framing and he he proceeded to not do that or he did not do that. Could not do that. Was not able to do that. You I know what believe, I mean. Like I, I, I just I agree, I agree with every version of that because yes, nothing that we saw over the summer. There was not a single move out there per se. You know, real or imagined that would have taken that would have done for the Blazers what just happened to the Bucks. That would have I taken literally them from had a someone place. in my mentions try to tell me. Well, they could have traded him for, for Brad number three, the number three pick for Brad Beal. I'm like, Why? I'm like, all right, man, have you looked at his salary? So what would the salary balancing be? And then is that team any better in the first place? Like I, you had like, yeah, some tethering between, to reality between in this Anthony Simons, nice. between Anthony Simons, Bradley Beal and Damian Lillard, you'd have like $120 million in payroll and three guards. <laughs> Well, I, the, I, the the trade wouldn't be legal unless you could balance it to within 120 percent, right? Brad Beal makes, however, what like 40 million dollars a year. So what that trade would have to be like you probably couldn't even make that trade. And if you could, yeah. you'd be left with like seven players. So like yeah, the, yeah. The, the the point no. is like yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say the, you know, the other ones, uh, Zion Williamson was out there. That, that was, that was a rumor of that. You Zion know, Williamson, could've, could've Kale Bridges, him. OG Ananobi, Pascal Siakam, Jalen yeah. Brown, Ira- ironically, Brandon early, Ingram, Zach Levine, 
earlier around this time of the draft. And we'll, we'll discuss for everybody wondering why we're not talking about Deandre Ayton. We'll discuss this stuff a little later on down the road when, yes, you know, we, we're, right we're going to talk about the actual team that we have that we're excited to see, but yes. not today. The, the ironic part is that apparently Deandre Ayton was available for, you know, uh, what was it? The number three and Anthony Simons or something like that. Some, some version of, of that where it was, uh, Ant was involved, but it, or no, sorry, Yusuf Nurkic and Anthony Simons. That was it. Uh, Phoenix was offering up DeAndre Ayton for those two. My Lord, how that asking price seemed to have fallen down. And I am much happier <laughs> with what they paid for it than what they could have paid for it. But that would have been a, a, a they stupid end up, reaction. They end up with, uh, <laughs> yeah. But they end up with Yusuf Nurkic, Grayson Allen, Nas Little, Keon Johnson. I mean, how many of those players can play in the playoffs. It can Yusuf Nurkic play in the playoffs. I I, I'm, I, again, not for today. We've talked too much about this stuff, but like, did the Suns get worse? Like, I mean, and I'm, when I say worse, the Suns needed depth. They needed depth. They needed bodies. Did they get any depth? Did they get any meaningful depth? They made, they got regular season depth. Did they get any playoff depth? I'm not even convinced that they did. So no, anyway, and, but, and I'll, I'll agree with you on that. But anyways, the, the whole basis of this is that uh, I, there is the real or imagined there has been nothing and everyone smarter than us agrees. There was no move to Ryan, be there's had no one smarter than you. <laughs> there was no move to be had. I'm not taking that bait. No move to be had that would have <laughs> that would have taken the Blazers from where they were at the end of last season to being a, a massive contender. And I don't think that the move to get better would have been the get back to the playoffs. Not so even a ma- I, here's the thing though. Not even a massive contender. I, I have look at my Twitter at Golmer PDX. I've spent the last two days really, really getting super direct with people articulate the trade between Dame's extension in July, 2022. Oh, the organization promised they'd build around Dame. If he signed this extension. Okay. Between July, 2022 and today, articulate Never mind the fact that Dame also asked for that extension. It was why yes, leaving that, that part, aside, leaving that part aside, articulate the trade and the, 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 the overwhelming majority of people get frustrated and flustered when you try to do that. I want to give a shout out to die mad uh, to KJ, he and I don't agree on everything. And sometimes we go back and forth a lot. I want to give it, give, give him a shout out. He articulated a trade that would be, you know, it would have to be three and Simons and multiple first round picks mm-hmm. from Mikhail bridges. And here's the thing. I'm, I don't even care whether that trade makes the blazers. Oh, so much better or not. But that's the kind of trade that we're talking about. So when we talk about Cronin lied, right, you have to say this is what he declined in order to do keep the pick. The reality is, you know, based on all the reporting that we have heard, there was no there may not have been any offer at all for the third pick, including how you balance the salaries. If there were, they were very few. And then it may not have made the team better. That's where they were. Mm-hmm. And so the other thing with the, the Cronin lied, and again, again, it's, you know, intentional or unintentional. He did. Um, I think some of the stuff that has come to light no, no, intentional, of, a lie is intent. That's the lie. The lie is the intent. I, I count the unintentional lie of the behind the scenes. He's telling Dame, Hey, we're going to sit you for these games because that's going to up our lottery odds. And those, and then getting a better draft pick is going to be able to get or allow us to make better trades. I, I say true. that is, like, I mean, that's not I, uh, that's... It, correct, but I say that that's an unintentional lie because I'm still not hundred percent sold that they realistically thought that they'd end up with the number three pick. And I'm also not hundred percent sold that, he, he didn't nec- that Cronin didn't necessarily buy the narrative that it would be a very busy draft night and you'd see a flurry of moves, which didn't happen. I just no, that reject, make I reject that there's no such thing as an unintentional lie. So I'm much more comfortable with the framing of like Cronin failed Cronin, unintentional incompetence. 
Can we go with sure. that? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Yeah, All right. Fine. So we'll because we'll the go whole with thing that. that people are so pissed about is that Cronin deceived Damian Lillard. I I just I literally am trying so hard to find any evidence at all of that. Haven't found any. So you know. Give it to me at Goldman PDX if you have any. Yes. Well, they'll just immediately point to the fact that, well, the, the, well he, he told, told the team he didn't told, get better. He, it's like, yeah, he, I get yeah. it. But yeah. He yeah. told anyway, him yeah. that if he, if he sits, that if he fakes this calf injury, which, oh boy, saying the quiet part out loud, I am extremely interested how that possible investigation will go. They're going to get a but, fine, um, just like the Mavericks did. Yep. But, uh, um, that's the that's the big one they'll point to is well he, he promised them that if if he sat and they get better or they, it helps their lottery odds that they could use that to trade to get better and he didn't do that so he lied so today are, this that's, is that's the, the again, number like, one he lied but this is this the, is a the, never the pro, ending again, circle we got to get the, off this hamster wheel okay fine so but uh, where I will also say is that it sounds like Cronin to some degree as all of this was going on where he also fucked up is he did not acquiesce to God. We're dropping that word. This title, this episode should just be called the <laughs> acquiescence, acquiescence pod. Yeah. Um, it's a great he, word. He, it's got he a C not, and a Q in it. It's pretty cool. Yeah. He did not go about trying to, engage his star player, keep his star player happy, communicate with him openly. And it almost seems like between Joe and Dame, things were just a snowball of toxicity. You mean after the trade request? And you mean I'm also saying just even, to be clear. I'm, I'm saying leading up to the trade request to some degree. I think from okay. the time I think from the time that that lottery ball came up with the Blazers at number three to the trade request is where this all kind of started to go a little bit South between those guys and just became that snowball effect of a little bit worse and worse and worse to the point where Cronin pulls the dick move and Dame's showing back up while he's still here and part of the team at his normal time that he does every year. And Cronin can't even be bothered to say hi. Yeah, it's a dick move, but look, and the league's got to, and again, the the league's got to get for his most valuable trade asset. And like, like, I, so so yeah, say something a, to him. Be like, dude, why is your agent got to be a dick? He iced the market. That's not what, that's not what the Cronin lied crowd are saying. They're not saying Joe Cronin's a, a big dick. I mean, they're saying <laughs> that he deceived Damian Lillard and then intentionally with intent chose to rebuild mm-hmm. the team. My argument again, is that July, 2022, they had certain assets at that time. They had certain draft picks that after that time, articulate the trade. It's very hard to do slash impossible. So I, I just, I like, yes, over promised. I get that. Like, um, yeah, but Joe Cronin absolutely deserves blame. No doubt about it. Yeah. So, and with that, uh, we're going to turn because we've referenced it enough. We're going to turn to uh, your little outrage corner and also the follow up <laughs> tidbit of is Joe Cronin a liar? So Brandon, please lead us down this rabbit hole and we will power through this quick guys. We know we went a little long, but this is a big topic sure and we, so yeah, kind of an important topic, uh, kind of like the most important, but yeah, I'll be quick about it. Welcome to Brandon's outrage corner. I solicited your feedback both on the trail casters discord and on Twitter really quick from the trail casters discord shout out to jaws who I've played basketball with and is a super cool guy. Um, he says, I guess just to give you some outrage, the lack of transparency from Cronin that started years ago when he took over for Olshay that subsequently plummeted us into the state of rebuild where there's more questions and answers has not quite killed my fandom, but certainly reinvigorated my thoughts that the team needs to be sold to someone with some passion. Yes. Someone with experience, yeah. someone who actually has a vision jaws. I could not agree more. Yeah. And I feel as though we kind of touched on that a little bit where I, where he's a bad salesman, I feel as though he was trying to say the right things that needed to be said without necessarily knowing if he a hundred percent certain could pull them off. He's been here long enough. He should know the Portland media market better. You say something, it better fucking happen. We still remember that uh, the Blazers have a 98.6% chance of being a playoff team with Al Farouk Amino at the four. Yep. (laughs) Jeez <laughs> Louise. Um, but you know, shout out to chief who again, Dame actually shouted out in his goodbye letter. So then I went to Twitter and I just put it out there. I said, we're recording today. Is Joe Cronin a liar? That's the question. These are your answers from Jeff Richmond at Jeff Richmond. 
And I love this answer that I start with. A lie includes a false statement of fact that was made with the intent to deceive. Yes, Jeff. Finding the former should be easy with the latter being difficult to prove. I have yet to see anyone show with verifiable evidence that Cronin made an unequivocally false statement of fact. Boom. Drop the mic. Jeff coming from the top rope. He is is Jeff a lawyer? That sounds like lawyer speak. I need to know. I Jeff, hit us it. up. I need to know if you're a lawyer. <laughs> he could be a lawyer or he could be anything else, but I totally agree. Um, Ty at the total package. No. <laughs> okay. That's easy. Okay. No, he's not. Um, well, take your answers Jeffers- off the air. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's out there. Now I'll go from the top uh, from Corvallis foodie at Corvallisonian. No, I think he was upfront as the GM could be Dame fucked around and found out. God bless you, Lindsay, for putting that in writing on the internet. Prayers for uh, your she, mentions as well. She is great. I met her once accidentally because we bumped into each other at a restaurant in Corvallis, and she knew who I was and recognized me. And I was like, who, what, what? It, it was very funny. Um, Hoodie Rich at the official MAB. The opening question at Media Day needs to be, did you tell Dame that returning to Portland wasn't an option during a meeting with him over the summer? Outside of hearing that, he made an extremely difficult situation turn into a much better haul than most thought. He's an absolute moron if he actually said that to Dame. Players will never stay loyal to a franchise with him at the control. As far as a trade negotiator, he called an all-time great basketball minds bluff and got back a better package than Miami was willing to offer. Doesn't really answer the question. No, it doesn't. I I definitely agree with that last part. He put, you know, he didn't get bullied into a corner by Pat Riley. I plead with everybody again, once again, get the full context of it. You know, Haynes even again, he expanded on it. There was never the option of Dame rescinding the trade and staying with the franchise forever. That was right. never that was never on the table. The no. thing that Cronin said no to was Dame coming back and having them have to go through media day and training camp and the start of the season. Possibly all the way up Miami to the trade has deadline. no pressure to up their offer, so it's the same offer. Like it doesn't yep. make sense. And, Why and would that you do cloud that? Cloud like, <laughs> hanging over everything, which so, yeah. would start to fuck up the developmental stuff that we want and need with Scoot. So, anyways, right. fair enough. Uh, I really like this answer from Jonathan Evers at Johnny Evers three been trying to articulate my thoughts in a concise way, but I think it boils down to Cronin lied. The lies were generally understandable, though probably not well advised, but alienating Dame on a personal level doesn't sit well with me. Agree. And that kind of goes back to, you know, where I had said that he's a, he's not the car salesman that old Shea was. So, you know, it's, yeah. you, I think a lot of people feel that way, right? Like it's and, like, and yeah, Jim's lie, but be nicer today. Maybe. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Again, dick move. Say hi to the man. Matt Lindell at Matt Lindell. No, there's only so much the public face for franchise can say in a press conference. He was upfront as he could be given that. Yep. I generally agree with that. Zach at Zach backpacks short answer. Maybe, but at the end of the day, he made the decisions best for the franchise and for all the pearl clutchers mad about him, not wanting Dame to rescind his request. He only wanted to stay in case Miami panned out. That's a distraction in a media circus, which Ryan was to your point. Yep. So, um, Frippo one at Dwayne. Okay. 66. Almost every team in the league is looking for another star. If it was that easy, then stars would be getting traded left and right just because he didn't lose or sorry, just because he didn't, doesn't mean that he failed. I disagree. I think he failed. I mean, I think just because everyone's trying to get a star doesn't mean that if you don't get a star, it means you didn't fail. You did fail. And it also seems as though, and it also seems as though stars move every summer constantly. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> exactly. Um, opinionated wino at opinionated wino. No, he's not a liar. He's an NBA GM who inherited a bad situation. He didn't succeed in keeping Dame happy, but I'm not convinced that there was a real package for Portland's non lowered assets. That's what I think. Cronin isn't a yeah. liar, but like any GM, he was never going to reveal everything. I don't think there was a path to the Blazers contending with Lillard. I also don't think that Lillard was so naive as to believe that package existed. He's not stupid. Yeah. And that's one of those things too, because Dame has spent how many years recruiting he knows right. how hard it is to get people out here. And in in the event of trying to recruit through trade, you need players that ask behind the scenes quietly to go to your team. Right. So exactly. Um, JC at John Cave Designs, Dame is the liar. Mm, I don't agree with that, but I respect the opinion. That, Not yeah, really. that's, a, that's a that's a hot one right there. I think like if you're saying like through Chris Haynes and stuff, like saying your story and kind of shading in a certain way, like, again, I don't think that's a lie. It's kind of your opinion ish. Like I'm fine with it. I don't think it's a lie. I'm, I don't, I, that's fine. Yeah. My opinion. Okay. Chris at blazer, Chris. Nope. I don't think he did. Uh, yep. I really don't think he did as in, I don't think Joe Cronin lied, but I do agree with his own words. He failed Dame. Agreed. Yep. 
<laughs> Cole Davenport at Cole Davenport 11. Yes, he's a liar and should have been more honest with Dame and the fans, but the moves that he made are best for the franchise. Also, fair. I don't, I don't think he should have been more honest with the fans. I, it, it, if it's be more honest with the fans, the honesty that I would appreciate a lot more is uh, saying less. Yeah, actually, if you that's don't, a good point. If you, like, if you don't have it, yeah, if you don't have your shit and all your ducks in a row, a hundred percent, and you know what you can do, saying less is more. Yeah, I there's a whole nother podcast to be had about the role of GMing and like what you can say and not say in discretion. But yeah, Jefferson Dittler at par, at Papa Shark game. Uh, it's not so much what he didn't do; it's what he did get to try that didn't work as Miami found out just telling another team that they have to do something doesn't mean they will try. I sorry. And I, I did a bad job copying this, but um, it's, I think what he's saying it's that it's not so much what he didn't do. It's that what he did try didn't work. And as Miami just found out telling another team that yeah. they have to do something doesn't mean they will. There we go. I just, I said it weird. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's totally fair. Um, mm-hmm. From BMAC, Brandon McDyre. What's up, man? At Brandon McDyre. If you think saying they were committed to building around Dame was a declaration of process or intention, I'd say no. We're all guessing whether or not he acted in good faith. I choose to believe he tried to do what he said, but had lines he wouldn't cross in trading the third pick. Yeah, I, think I mean, that, I, think, I that's, think that's perfectly fair. And, I think and a big totally thing fair. with that, I think that's a great nuanced take, but it, I think that's also one that I've seen get absolutely raked over the coals. And that that's where I try to push back when I get pushed back from people on things that I say, I'm like, this is just how I view it. This is a situation I'm, we're looking from the outside, just as everybody else. I'm not trying to convince you to think like me, have your own thoughts. Please don't attack me for having my thoughts and my opinions on the matter. And I think that, you know, Brandon, I think that's a great take and, you know, I pray for your mentions as well. <laughs> <laughs> Last one from heme germ at dinger donks. All sides are liars. I wish Dame was still a blazer, but I don't find it in bad faith that the organization felt as though the situation was beyond repair. If Blazers had sent Dame to Toronto, I'd be feeling very differently. Instead, he's on a championship favorite with a two-time MVP. Dame is my favorite player of all time. I lost no respect for him personally during this whole ideal, this whole ordeal. We reached a place where only the only opinion, the only option was to make a deal or to continue to trot out middling rosters that don't fit. Yep. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's what's hilarious at the end of the day for as pissed off as Dame is for as pissed off as everybody is. And for all the talk of like all the other players are going to be watching to see how you treat them. Well, guess what? They didn't trade Dame to his preferred destination. They sent him to a fucking better one where he's now a title favorite for the first time in his career, easily playing with the best player he has ever played with on a team where he's not the number one and it's not on his shoulders. Totally. I he actually could not this, ask for a better. This is basketball Mecca. I said this him. to the homie, Evan McCarthy at Evan MPDX um, that, I mean, Dame may come to <laughs> in the future. He may look back on this and be like, I'm so fucking glad I went to Milwaukee. Like, like it, there, there is a he would be the first human being to say that no. <laughs> he could literally get multiple titles. He could get no titles, but he could, he's, Damian Lillard's on the best team he's ever been on. He is it's yeah. There's so much more that we could say about it. Do you have anything else? I got nothing. You want to take us out? I do. First of all, I appreciate everybody who replied and to all of you people, we are going to be here during the season. I'm going to be engaging with people as much as I can on Twitter, because I do think this podcast is more fun and more interesting with more voices on it. You can only hear so much of Brandon. Okay. Like you can only hear so much of it, but if you do want to hear us, you can always reach out to us at like the blazers on Twitter at we like the blazers.com. You can also find Ryan on Twitter at the witty Ryan. You can find me at golden PDX and that is going to do it. I really do appreciate you all. Seriously. Thank you. And until next time, go blazers, go blazers.